Bible, if you will, and turn to the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy and chapter uh, 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. So if you have trouble finding 1 Timothy, it's right before 2 Timothy. It's <laughs> in the New Testament. If you get to the book of Hebrews, you're a little bit too far and then back up a little bit, and you'll be there. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and I want us to read verses 8 to 17. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 to 17. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. But we know that the law of God is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for man manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which is committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And for the grace of of our Lord and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit, for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Christ Jesus might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou mightest uh, war a good warfare. Call your attention to verse 15. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the clarity of it. Thank you for the availability of it. And Lord, we pray that you would use your word and guide us by your Holy Spirit into all truth. Help us, Lord, to be open and receptive to your word. Help us not to be distracted by the cares of the world and the cares of the weak. But for these next few moments, just to set aside everything else and focus upon you and upon the message that we are to receive from your word this day. Now, Lord, again, we pray if there's a soul here who does not know you as Savior, that this might be their day of salvation, this is their hour of decision. For those who do know you, help us to get the big picture, to truly understand what your plan is. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to throw some thoughts out for you this morning. Number one. We talk about God. Now, God is the creator. One of the first things we're told about God, not the very first thing, but within the same first verse, one of the first things we're told about God is that he's the creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So who is God? God is the creator. Uh, our Declaration of Independence. <clears throat> this country says that all men are created with equal, uh, uh, sorry, let me try that again. All men are created equal and are endowed by their creator, capital C, with certain inalienable rights. So, who are they acknowledging? They're not acknowledging God, who is the creator. Now, God is the creator, and God had a plan and purpose for his creation. He didn't uh, produce the creation because he was out there in eternity somewhere, didn't have anything better to do. Like, yeah, I think I'll make the universe. Boom, there it is. Okay, I'm done with that. Move on to the next thing. No. Not like that at all. There's a plan and a purpose for creation. There's a plan and a purpose for every part of creation, and that includes you and I. So God has a plan and a purpose for your life. So getting the big picture is understanding God's plan and purpose. Now, we're, we don't have time to 
explore God's plan and purpose for every aspect of creation. It would, it would take far more time than we have today. But I want to focus in on one part of it, the big picture of why Jesus Christ came into this world. Now to get to that, let me ask you another question. Why do people come to church? The answer to that question is probably as varied as the number of people in a congregation. You go ask everybody here, why do you come to church? We get probably that many different answers. And that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just how it is. <clears throat> People come for many reasons. I can't give you all of them. Let me give you seven of the main reasons people come to church. And maybe when I finish this list of seven, you'll say, well, that's not my reason. Or maybe I've got two or three together. That's fine. It's not meant to be an exhaustive list. But these are seven of the main reasons. Fellowship. People come to church to fellowship. Christians come to church to be with other Christians. And I'll be honest with you. I like going to church for that reason. That's not the only reason, but I like going to church for the fellowship. Well, I can worship God by myself sitting out on a boat and lake. You know what? That's true, you can. But you're not getting fellowship with other believers that way. Right. You know, when you're missing something. And first John chapter one tells us God has called us to fellowship with each other. He's called us to fellowship with him, first of all, and then to fellowship with each other. Uh, Two great commandments, Jesus said, love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might, and your neighbor as yourself. Well, you may love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might, so it's a little bit questionable if you say that, but you're not doing what you know God wants you to do. Secondly, how can you love your neighbor as yourself if you have no interaction with other people, if you stay by yourself all the time? That's why God has not called Christians to a monastic way of life. What does that mean? We're not supposed to go hibernate somewhere in a monastery and, and have devotions and pray. I'm not knocking having devo devotions and praying. That's very important. I go so far as to say it's essential. But what I am saying is this. If that's all you ever did, you're not doing God's will. Because God wants you to reach out to other people. And God wants you to fellowship with other people. So one reason to come to church is fellowship. I like, last Sunday my wife and I were in another place. And we went to church. And with the church we went to, it was good to be there with God's people in God's house and fellowshipping on the Lord's day. And uh, I, I tell you, uh, we had a, a wonderful service that we attended. A tremendous time. So fellowship. Number two, music. Some people come to church for the music. Uh, they like the music and they want to come to church for the music. Now, one thing's for sure. In society and in churches, uh, there are vast and strong opinions about music. Well, I don't like this, and I don't like that, and I like this, and I like that. You know what we really need to do about that? We need to set aside our likes and dislikes, and we need to get down and say, what honors God? That's what we really need to do. Some people come to the teaching. I like the teaching. I want to learn. I want to grow. And I like the teaching. Some come because they are genuinely seeking God. They really want to get closer to God. And they want to come to know God. Some people come to church. I'm not making this up. I could cite specific incidents and too many of them. For business opportunities. To see who they can network with to increase their business. Well, nobody's ever come to church like this. This church is that mode, have they? Yeah, I have to admit. Okay. I'm not going to name anybody, and there's nobody here this morning, so don't start thinking he's talking about me. Um, the, the, the truth of the matter is, yes, people do that. There was, years ago, a, another church in our county, and it wasn't a bad idea, but they had one day a week, I, I want to say it was Wednesday, it may not have been, one day a week, they had at the church a businessman's luncheon. And they would put on lunch, and businessmen were invited to come, and businessmen would come, and they'd have lunch together, and then the pastor of the church would bring a short message, and uh, all within an hour's time, and so they'd do it on their lunch hour, and go. Now, there were men who went to that because it was an opportunity for Christian fellowship. There were people who went to that because they wanted to hear God's word. There were people who went to it just because they wanted a meal. And there were people who went there, and I, I 
heard men say this, you know, it's a great place to network for a business. You know, there's other businessmen there we can network. So do people do that? Yes. Some people, and I'm not, by the way, I'm not saying none of these are valid reasons. I want you to understand it. Some people come to church for fun. Fun? Yeah, they actually have fun going to church. Well, who do you know that has fun going to church? Me. I have fun going to church. I do. Okay? And I enjoy it. I have a good time. So fun, some people go to church for fun. Some people go to church out of a sense of obligation. Well, it's Sunday. I guess i got to go to church. You know, I'm really... Not because they want to. They just feel like they're obligated to. Now, are those the only... I gave you seven. Are those the only reasons people go to church? No. Could one of those reasons be yours? And as we said earlier, could two or three of them be yours? Yes. Could I have missed yours altogether? Entirely possible. Entirely possible. So, you know, please don't come to me later and say, well, you forgot one. I probably forgot hundred. Okay? So I, I understand that. It wasn't meant to be an exhausted list. The point that I'm trying to make with you is this. It's very simple. For all of the different reasons or combination of reasons people go to church, some people miss the big picture. They miss what it's really all about. Let's draw that down to a little bit finer point. Here we are, first Sunday of December. It's December 2nd. I don't know about you, but I am absolutely astounded that it is December 2nd, 2018. I mean, why isn't it December 2nd, 1958? I don't, I, I don't know. Okay, but here we are. December 2nd, 2018. Time is going quickly. Uh, a gentleman said to me just a few days ago, he said, uh, you know, when I was a child, they told me that, adults told me that the older you get, the faster time goes. He says, I think that's true. I said, I guarantee you that's true. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. But why do we celebrate Christmas? My wife and I were uh, with some friends last night, and we went to a, a concert. And one of the songs was actually the one I liked the best. I think that I mean, none of it was bad. But, uh, the song I think I liked the best asked the question, would it still be Christmas if Jesus didn't come? Well, the answer to that is no. It wouldn't be Christmas. It would still be December 25th, but it wouldn't be Christmas if Jesus didn't come. That's what it's all about. It's all about the fact that Jesus came. So why celebrate that? Well, again, the answer to why we're celebrating Christmas, if you ask, probably you get the number of people you ask, that's how many answers you get. You ask 10 people, you get 10 answers. You ask 100 people, you get 100 answers, and so forth. But the big picture is to understand that the Lord Jesus came into this world and to understand why he came. I was taking a class called History of Civilization in college years ago, and this is the first place I heard this phrase used. I've heard it many times since then, and I really do not know where it originated, but it is true. The teacher of that class probably the first day of class, I, I don't remember, early on in the course, said this, I want you to understand that history is his story. And it really is. History is his story. What does it mean? It's God's story. It's God telling us about his story. And that's how history unfolds. So the big picture, again, is to understand the reason that the Lord Jesus came into this world. Paul writes to Timothy and to us and helps us to understand this. Take a look at verse 8, if you will. We read it a little bit ago. And in verse 8, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, but we know that the law is good. What law? The law of the state of Florida? Well, I'm sure Paul didn't mean that because there was no state of Florida when he heard this. The law of God. And we know that the law is good. Now, you know there are folks who don't believe that. They don't believe the law is good. Uh, matter of fact, there are people who just soon leave the law out of the Bible. Uh, we don't need that there. All those do's and don'ts and thou shalt and thou shalt not. And all. We need to just ignore all that and be better off just get rid of it. I've talked to a lot of people who think that way. 
they're wrong. <laughs> How do you know they're wrong? Well, I just read First Timothy 1 to 8. For one thing, it says the law is good. You know, buying the law is good, number one, it's part of God's word. Number two, I'm almost <clears throat> saying the same thing as number one, but it's not exactly the same. It's good because God gave it. Number three, understand this. The law has a purpose. Yes, to tell me I can't do what I want to do. Well, not exactly. Okay. If, if that's what you think, that's what a lot of people think. You just <coughs> the big picture. I didn't finish the verse. Let's go back and look at it again. We know the law is good if, if a man use it lawfully. So the law is good if you use it for what it was intended to be. Well, Paul, if I can follow you there. Well, that's good because there's a semicolon in the end of verse 8, not a period, so he's not finished expressing his thought. Verse 9, knowing this, Paul says, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless. You know what he's saying there? Same thing Jesus was saying when he said, said the Son of Man has not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Look, if you're already righteous, and by the way, the word righteous means perfect. Morally and spiritually perfect. So if you're already righteous, you don't need the law. My goodness, you're already perfect. Why would you need the law to tell you what's right and wrong, good and bad? You wouldn't need it. And if you're already righteous, you're already perfect. You don't need a savior. Well, I mean, you're already perfect. What would you be saved from? You don't need a savior. So Jesus said he didn't come to call the righteous to repentance. He came to call sinners to repentance. Remember that. Why did Jesus say he came? He said he came to call sinners to repentance. Okay. Go back to verse 9, 1 Timothy 1, 9, knowing this, the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless. And then he describes some of what that means to be lawless. The lawless and disobedient, to disobey God. You know what the original sin was? Boy, you ask that, you'll get a lot of different answers to the original sin was disobedience. It was disobeying God. Pure and simple. So the law is made for a righteous man, not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless, the disobedient, the ungodly, those who are without God, and for sinners, those who break God's law, for unholy and profane, murders of fathers and murders of mothers. Do you know, to me, that's inconceivable that anybody would murder their parents. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but just think, have you ever heard of anybody murdering their parents? And if you think very long, you say, yeah, I have. Sure I have. For manslayers, a manslayer is somebody who kills somebody else. <laughs> See, there's, and I'm not an attorney, and I'm not pretending to be, I want to make that very clear, but there's a difference legally between murder and manslaughter. A murder is that you killed this person and you meant to do it and you carried it out. Now whether it was premeditated murder or not, this person second degree murder and all that, but it's still murder. You intended to kill this person and you did it. Manslaughter, you may or may not have intended to kill him, but you still did. Make make sense to you? Okay. So manslayers for whoremongers, I hope I don't have to explain that to you. For them that defile themselves with mankind, that's pretty clear also. For men-stealers, you know what a men-stealer is? We don't say men-stealers anymore, you know what we say? Kidnappers. People that steal other people. Does that go on? All the time. It's horrific. This should never happen. For liars. Well, you know, you know you're talking about murder, kidnapping, all this and liars, you're gonna group liars in there with that? I mean, you know, lying isn't quite as bad as murder and kidnapping and these kind of things. Well, folks, let me share something. I didn't put it on the list. God did. And God groups liars. And remember what Jesus said about that? 
John 8, 44, he says, You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a liar from the beginning, and the father of it. Oh, so when I'm lying, I'm doing the work of Satan? Can you do that? That's exactly what it's saying. So liars, for perjured persons, uh, people who lie uh, when they're swearing to tell the truth, now watch this. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, sound teaching. Paul saying this isn't an exhaustive list. This is some of the things that the law was given to show us they're wrong. But there's many other things, any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, sound teaching. You know what we still haven't done? We still haven't come to a period. Really? I'll check it out. Verse 11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, period. What does verse 11 mean with the context of verses 8 through 10? Sound doctrine, the teaching that is according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, Paul says, which was committed to his trust. So all of these things in this list he gave, and anything else you can think of that's contrary to the sound doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, now that raises another question, doesn't it? What is the gospel of Jesus Christ? <clears throat> the purpose of the law of God is to give us an absolute standard of righteousness and to show us how we literally have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. You can read this list and you can say, well, I haven't done... Uh, any of those things, well, uh, I almost have it because there's that wire thing, but I, I don't do that very much, and I, you know, I, I really try not to, and it's not the point, is it? Let me ask you a question. How many times does a person have to murder to be a murderer? Once. Okay. How many times do you have to lie to be a liar? Once. Okay. How many times do you have to sin to be a sinner? Once. <laughs> you get the idea. So God created man, and God created man because he loved man. He didn't create man. God is not some cruel monster living in another realm who just created people as toys, and when he gets tired of them, he just destroys them. So that's, that's not true. That's not the big picture. God creates man to have an object of affection. We heard the song about it just a little bit ago. We've sung about ourselves this morning. God loves people. That means God loves you. No question about it. Well, I don't always feel like God loves me. That's not really the point. God doesn't love you because of how you feel. God loves you because of how you feel. I heard somebody say this yesterday. And I said, you know, that's, that's really good. That's really true. He said, God doesn't want us to to be good so that he'll love us. He loves us so that we'll be good. That really makes sense, doesn't it? It really does. So in verse 12, Paul says, belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ changes lives and saves souls. Look at verse 12. He says, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry. Paul's talking about himself here. He says, I'm so thankful to God that he counted me as a faithful person. He put me in the ministry. Why? Verse 13. Who was before? Who was before? Paul was before. Before what? Before he met Jesus. Paul was a blasphemer. One who dishonored God. Now don't don't misunderstand. Paul was a very religious man. And you know what he says? I was a blasphemer. How can he be a very religious man and a blasphemer? Because he denied God's truth. He was full of ritual. He was full of religion. But he wasn't filled with God. And he denied God's truth. He didn't even know God. He was a religious leader. But he didn't know God. Well, how can a guy be a religious leader and not know God? Believe me, it happens too many times. Too many times. 
So he says he was before a blasphemer and he persecuted. He did. He persecuted people who believed in Jesus. He had someone put in jail. He had someone killed. He was witness to the first man who was killed for his faith in Jesus. As injurious, he hurt people. Notice in the middle of verse 13, he said, But I obtained mercy. What does that mean? It means for all of my wickedness, all of my wrong, all of my sin, God did not destroy me. He gave me mercy. Oh, thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his love. Thank God for his grace. Because I did it for <coughs> her and I believe. Two different things. Number one, Paul says I was ignorant. Now, he was a very educated man. He was very highly expect, uh, respected for his education. I mean, it was as if he could have come out in, in today's terms and said, I have multiple doctorates from and named some of the most prestigious universities there are. Now, he didn't go to university because where he lived in that time and place, that's not how you got your education. How you got your education in that time and place, you went to certain well-known teachers and you studied under them as a disciple. And he had done that. He had done that. And so he was considered one of the most well-educated men of his day. Well-read, multilingual, conversant in many areas, very educated man. But he says, I was ignorant. What was he ignorant of? The big picture. He was ignorant of the big picture that God had. Secondly, he says it was unbelief. He didn't believe. What did he not believe? He didn't believe what he himself would later proclaim. <clears throat> One day, Paul and Silas, his companion, were at Philippi, a place to where later he would write the book of Philippians. And they were preaching, and a young lady kept interrupting them, and what she would say was not wrong. What she said was true. But the fact is, she kept interrupting them so that they couldn't speak the message. Finally, Paul turns to her and rebukes a demonic spirit that was with her, and that demonic spirit left. And you think everybody said, well, thank God, praise God, this poor girl, she was oppressed by an evil spirit, and now she's free, and she's saved, and that's wonderful. It's not what happened. There were people who said, we were making money off of her, having her put on a show and tell people fortunes and all this kind of stuff. We made money off of her, and now our money's gone. Mm -hmm. Let's get those guys. Mm -hmm. And Paul and Silas ended up in jail. What was their crime, preaching? And they handled it so much better than, than most of us would have. Well, let me not speak for you. Better than I probably would have. Because at midnight, they're sitting in a pit in a prison. And they're not sitting there saying, it's dark down here, and it's cold, and it's wet, and I don't like it, and I didn't do anything wrong, and I don't deserve to be here, and it's just not right, and those people are just, they're bad people, and I was doing right, and I was doing the good thing, and I was serving God, and here I am down in the pit! <laughs> they didn't do that. They didn't do that. You know what they did? They said, Praise God from all my sins flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's what they did. You know what? The jailer heard him singing, and he said, what is going on? And then there was an earthquake. Oh, boy, he said, I'm in trouble now. <laughs> because in that day and time, he was working for the Romans. In that day and time, if you were guarding a prisoner, and your prisoner escaped, you were responsible, and they would execute you for it, for letting your prisoner escape. Well, guess what? He didn't have one prisoner. He had a whole prison full of prisoners. They had an earthquake, and the doors of the prison swung open during the earthquake. <laughs> and this guy said, I've had it. The Romans are going to kill me. I might as well get it over now. Pulled out the sword. He was going to kill himself. And Paul calls out the pit says, do thyself no harm. We're all here. So it says he called for a light and sprang in. 
What does that mean? They were down in a pit. He jumped down where they were. And he fell down before them. And he asked one of the most important questions ever asked in the history of the world. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? <laughs> Paul's answer was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Yeah. And he did. He and all his, meaning all his family. That was more of a story, but stop right there. I'm telling you, when Paul says here, writing Timothy, that he lived his life before in unbelief, he didn't believe, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. He didn't believe in Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, he was the enemy of Jesus Christ until one day he met Jesus Christ. He changed his life. Many years ago, it was the month of August, 1969. I met Jesus Christ. Not the same way Paul did. It wasn't nearly as dramatic. It was just as real. And I realized that I was a sinner and I trusted the Lord Jesus to save me and he did and he changed my life entirely. The grace. Verse 14. The grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Paul tells us how he was before. He was a blasphemer, persecutor, injurious, but he obtained mercy and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love in Christ Jesus. You know what Paul's saying? I met Jesus and he changed my life. Now, we went through all that to get to verse 15. This is the big picture. Paul says, first of all, verse 15, this is a faithful saying. And we say, pay attention to this. This is true. This is truth. This is a faithful saying. What is a faithful saying? It's worthy of all acceptation. Not only is it true, but everybody ought to accept this as true. What is it that Christ Jesus came into the world? Stop there. There's no punctuation mark there, but stop right there. Everybody ought to accept this ironclad truth that Christ Jesus came into the world. Now, I've heard people say Jesus was a myth, and I've heard people say Jesus never existed. And no... Folks, don't listen to that. I could give you easily 10 reasons, solid reasons not to listen to that. Starting with the fact that I met Jesus and I have a personal relationship with him. Number two, you can say, well, that's you talking, that doesn't prove anything. All right, number two, you have the Bible. And while the Bible doesn't count, why? It's a religious book. Stop and think about this. This is fact. You don't have to take my word for this. You can research this out for yourself. The Bible is the oldest complete manuscript in existence on any subject. You talk about history, this is the most complete volume of history there is. Well, then we have the writings of Buddha. Did you know Moses wrote before Buddha did? Well, what about the writings of Muhammad? Do you know Jesus lived 600 years before Muhammad did? We can go on and on with that, but I think you got the idea. Now, there are other ancient documents. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. There are other ancient documents that you don't have complete histories like you have in the Bible. You don't. The Bible is still the best-selling book on the planet and has been for a long, long time. And there's a good reason for that. People find truth there. All right. Another reason. There is extra biblical, that means outside of the Bible, written historical evidence of the existence of Jesus Christ. There is archaeological evidence of the existence of Jesus Christ. We can go on and on with this, but there's no reason to doubt that Jesus Christ came into this world. None. There is more proof, hard evidence, if you will, in, you want a scholarly term? There's more empirical evidence. Doesn't that sound educated? 
for the existence of Jesus Christ than there is for the existence of Julius Caesar. And that is a fact. Nobody doubts that Caesar existed. <laughs> but you say, well, I don't know if Jesus existed. Then you're ignoring the evidence. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came in the world. That is a fact. Christ Jesus came in the world. But if that's all there is to it, it may not mean any more than the fact that Julius Caesar once lived. It must be accepted that Jesus Christ came into this world. But why? Why? So very well-meaning, very scholarly, and very religious people will answer that question. So I'll tell you why he came to glorify God. That sounds wonderful, doesn't it? It does. But if you'll stop and think that through, that's pretty generic. What do you mean pretty generic? Well, he came to glorify God. It doesn't tell you how he glorified God. He came in and that glorified God. No. Here it is. This is very clear. Start again, beginning of verse 15. This is a faithful saying. It is true and worthy of all acceptation. Everybody ought to accept it. That Christ Jesus came into the world. Why, Paul? Why did he come? To save sinners. That's why. The verse we heard quoted earlier. God so loved the world, that's the people in the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that's Jesus Christ. That, don't miss this word, whosoever. Put it in modern English, anybody, anyone, anyone who wants to, whosoever, believeth in him, believes in him, will not perish, will not die, but have everlasting life. That is the big picture. That is what God wants. That's why God made mankind, because he wants mankind to dwell with him forever. But mankind sinned and separated themselves from God. And God says, I don't want this separation. I'm going to buy you back. And he did, and he gave his only begotten son who came to this earth, lived a sinless life, and then went to the cross for my sin and for Paul's sin. How do you know it was for Paul's sin? Well, first of all, he died for everybody's sin. He took the penalty, which was death, the wages of sin and death. He took that penalty for everybody. But you are holding up born again believer, you're only a child of God when you accept that he paid for your sin. Let me try and illustrate this way. I could say, I believe Jesus died for the sin of the whole world. Is that true? It is. That is true. That doesn't save me. What saves me, what did save me, is when I believe that Jesus died for my sin. Amen. And that's what Paul says right here. Look again at verse 15. This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. You know what he's saying there? I'm the worst sinner that ever lived. Now, I don't know about you, probably not true of any of you, but there was times in my life that I felt like I could give you some competition for that problem. But the, the fact of the matter is, Paul's got a pretty good claim here. What do you mean? Well, go back to verse 14. I'm sorry, 13. He was a blasphemer, a persecutor of those who believed in Jesus. He was injurious. He hurt people. He's pretty bad. People went to prison because of him. People died because of him. That's pretty bad, folks. Pretty bad. <clears throat> But he says, Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners like me. And I'm probably the worst of all. That is the big picture. So when we, as followers of Christ, when we as children of God are living our Christian life, it ought to be with the goal and with the motive of helping other people to come to know him. Look at verse 16. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering 
from pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting life. Here's what he said. God saved me, Paul says. God saved me to use me as a testimony to others. That if, if a wicked man like me can be saved, you can be saved too. That's what he's saying. Did that come to pass? Let me tell you a story I heard many decades ago. Two men, young men in England, who were very scholarly, uh, met together for lunch one day, and neither of them were Christians. And not only were they not Christians, they thought it would be a good thing to disprove Christianity. So they came up with a plan over lunch one day, and they said, let's take two years, and each one of us will take one goal. I am going to go out and prove that Jesus Christ never rose from the dead. And you go out and disprove the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the Apostle. If we can disprove either one, or better yet, both of these things, we'll disprove Christianity. And you know what? That's true. If you can disprove one of those things, or both of them, you can disprove Christianity. So they agreed to meet again in two years. They met in the same place, sat at the same table, and decided to compare their evidence. And the first man spoke and said, well, I know what we agreed. I, I was going to spend two years building a case to disprove the resurrection of Jesus. You're going to take two years building a case to disprove the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul. Let's see what we came up with. And the second fellow said, well, I did my study on the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, and I'm 100% convinced that it's true. <coughs> he said, not only that, I myself have become a Christian. What about you? And the other fellow said, I set out to disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I studied every resource I could find. And I come to the inescapable conclusion that it's true. And I myself have become a Christian. Is that story true? I'm pretty sure it is, but if you <coughs> don't think that's true, there are modern day examples of the same thing. Of people who have set out to disprove the resurrection and the conversion of Saul to Tarsus and found it to be true and become believers. So in verse 17, Paul gives glory to God. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. All of this brings glory to God. Let's conclude. Let me ask you some questions. Now don't raise your hand, don't answer out loud. These are things to think about. Are you a sinner? Don't, don't need to respond, just think about it. Are you a sinner? Have you ever done anything that would be wrong that would be considered sin? The Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yes, maybe as we said earlier, you're not a murderer or a kidnapper, you haven't done those things. Uh, but that's not the question. The question is, are you a sinner? Second question. Do you understand that the reason we celebrate Christmas, that the reason that we talk about, the reason we meet here every Sunday morning, is that Jesus Christ came into this world to save you? Question number three. Do you understand that when he went to the cross, he paid for your sins? All of them. Whatever you can think of in your life ever that you may have done that would be sin, he paid for that. Question number four. Have you trusted him to forgive your sins and save your soul? Question number five. Are you a good testimony for him? Are you trying to bring other people to know him so that they can be saved just like you have? Question number six. Are you bringing glory to God through your life? It's very simple. Let me answer those questions for myself. 
you answer them for yourself. Am I a sinner? Yes. Do I understand Jesus came into this world to save me? Yes. I, I understand, though I don't deserve it. If I were the only sinner to ever live, he still would have come. Have I trusted him to forgive my sins and save my soul? Yes. I can tell you about the time. I can show you the place. Yes. Am I a good testimony for him? I'm certainly trying to. Am I trying to bring others to him? Yes. Am I bringing glory to God in my life? Well, that's certainly my will. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for Christ Jesus who came to this world to save sinners. That when we celebrate at Christmas time, what we're really celebrating is that the Savior came. And Lord, it is my prayer that you'd help each and every one of us gather here this morning to know and to understand that we, like Saul of Tarsus, are sinners. That you love us. That you sent your only Son, your only begotten Son, to pay for our sins, who rose from the dead after the cross, and who will forgive anyone and everyone who will trust him. We're not talking about taking on a new religion. We're not talking about joining an organization. We're talking about putting our faith in the person of Jesus Christ. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If there's even a single person here this morning who cannot honestly say, I, I know for sure that there's been a time and a place in my life where I trusted Jesus to save me. He forgave my sins. He saved my soul. He changed my life. I'm on my way to heaven. If there's a single person here who can't honestly say that's true, my invitation right now is for you to open your heart and call on him. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call on him from your seat and say, Lord, I believe. I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe that you love me. I believe that you paid for my sins at the cross. And right here, right now, I'm trusting you as a living Savior to forgive me, to save my soul, you give me a home in heaven forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Maybe you prayed that prayer, maybe you didn't. Would you like to get that settled once and for all? We're going to sing a song. We're going to leave the platform. We'll stand out in front. God has spoken to your heart. You'll come. We'll have somebody help you. Again, we're not talking about joining the church or going through some religious ritual. Just take the Bible and show you how you can know that God loves you. Jesus paid for your sins. He'll forgive you. He'll give you everlasting life, and then you go on your way. Maybe you hear this one and say, Preacher, I'm saved. I expect that's the case with most of the people here, if not, in fact, everyone. But do you have the big picture? It's so easy to get distracted by other things. It's so easy to get distracted by things of lesser importance. They may be important, but they're of lesser importance. It's so easy to get distracted by personal feelings, personal ideas, personal ambitions. Do you have a big picture? God spoke in your heart this morning. Maybe it's something we've talked about here this morning. Maybe it isn't, but you know God's dealing with you. You need to respond. You come while we sing. Father, bless and move this invitation time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're singing this morning.